before, he was talking about the prodigal son. And you can come dressed as a pig, or I thought, just come dressed as a Baptist. You say, why? Because the prodigal was broke by the end of that story, amen? Well, broke. Mark chapter 4, I guess that's not too funny, sorry. If you're having financial trouble, I apologize. Mark chapter 4, let's all stand this morning for a little bit. For those of you that can stand, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. And I want to talk to you about getting to the other side. Getting to the other side. Mark chapter 4. And if you would, look at verse number 34. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. Uh, let me say this. If you want to get some things from the Lord, you've got to learn to get alone with him. All right, Verse 35. And the same day when the even was come, that's evening, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto... The other side. When they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say to him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly, and said one, one, uh, one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Chapter 5, look if you would at verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man, with an unclean spirit. Father, this morning we thank you for the word of God. Thank you that we have something to talk about, Lord, something to look at, something we can hold in our hands and know is your mind for us, Lord, your words to us. And Father, I ask that you would bless the time that we have in it, or truth be told, Lord, myself included, we don't spend enough time with you. We don't spend enough time in this book. And Lord, I pray that we would be immersed in it this morning, that you'd help us to remove the thoughts and the cares of this life. Lord, I pray that you'd teach your people about how to get to the other side and, Lord, what it's all about. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that's not saved, or that they would understand that the other side for them is not a, not a great thing yet, but it could be. Lord, the other side for them is a place of torment and anguish and a place called hell. We don't want anyone here to go there, Lord. There's... That's not your plan. Lord, you're not willing that any should perish. Lord, I pray that the other side for them could be changed today if there's anybody here that's lost. Lord, teach us from your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated if you would. Be seated if you would. I don't know everybody here too personally, but I'm going to assume that if you're saved... At the beginning of 2018, there's probably some things that you looked at and said, you know what, I want this to change in my life. Maybe you look at another Christian and you see that they have victory in a certain area, or you see that, that, that they have a family, and you look at their family and go, man, I, I want our family to be like that family. Or, I, I want to I have more joy in my life. I want to have more peace in my life. I want to go there in my life. Let, let me say it to you like this. Looking is helpful, but it doesn't get you there. And the Lord himself is calling you, and he's calling you to go to the other side. You say, what does that other side represent? It represents growth as a Christian. It represents improvement from where you're at. It represents understanding who God is greater today than you did yesterday. It's a deeper knowledge. Paul says it this way, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul, when he writes that, he's already saved. He knows him as a Savior, but he wants to know him intimately. What is that? That's going to the other side. That's getting beyond where you're at today. I read this. There's always room for improvement. That room is the biggest room in the house. Amen? <laughs> That's good. Uh, go with me to Hebrews. We're going to take a real quick trip through Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7. There's a word that shows up a lot in the book of Hebrews, and the word is simply this, better, better. You know what the Lord wants for you? Better. Amen. Listen, there's some things better, and I'm not talking, listen, let me just get, to, let me get this out of the way right now. 
I'm not the TV evangelist preacher that tells you, okay, now that you're saved, God wants you to drive a Rolls Royce, you're never going to be sick, and you're going to just live with, I mean, money's going to fall out of the sky, and if you tithe and plant your seed of faith to this church, uh, and you leave your seed of faith uh, right here, uh, then the Lord will shower down. I'm not here to tell you that at all. Far this fun thing from the truth, all right? Uh, but I will tell you this, God does want better things for you spiritually than where you've been. He wants to take you beyond where you're at. And it doesn't matter whether you've been saved for, for a month or saved for 25 years. There is always room for improvement. There's always something you don't know about your Savior yet. There's always somewhere else He wants to take you. What do you call that? You call it better. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse number 22. Hebrews chapter number 7 and verse number 22. Hebrews 7 verse 22. We're going to make this trip, trip very quick through the book of Hebrews. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. You say, what is that? He's saying, look, this new covenant, it's a whole lot better than the old one. Aren't you glad you're in on that new testament thing? Amen. All right. Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse number 6. Hebrews chapter 8. Look at verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. You might say the Lord wants some more excellent things for you. By how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. You see a theme here? Uh, look at Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter 9, look at uh, Hebrews 9, verse 23. I told you we're going to have to move fast through Hebrews. Hebrews 9, 23. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. You say, what's that better sacrifice? Jesus Christ himself. Look at Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Look, if you would, at verse number 34. Hebrews 10, verse 34. For he had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Can I say this? Regardless of whether you're rich or poor in this life, man, you've got something better if you're saved up there. Amen. All right, look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, verse 16. Hebrews 11, verse 16. Listen, guys, uh, we could argue about this. Uh, opinions are like armpits. We all have them. Sometimes they stink. Amen. Uh, apply deodorant. You see what does that mean? Apply God's thought on it. Amen. All right. But that said, we could argue about which country in the world is the best. I personally feel like I live in the best country in the world. It's got a lot of problems. Got a lot of problems. But I don't find a better place to live than this one. Now, that said, this ain't nothing compared to heaven. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 16. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Look, if you would, same chapter in verse number 40. Same chapter, Hebrews 11, verse number 40. God, having provided some better thing for us. Guys, can I say this? The Lord wants better for you than what you had in 2017. The Lord wants better for you than where you're at right now. You know what Paul says? Paul says it th like this. He says, uh, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and what? Reaching forth unto those things which are before. You know what that means? What I had back there, it may, be, it may even have been good, but I want something better. I want something deeper with Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning, can I say this? You've been invited to the other side. Look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. Uh, verse 35. Let me say this, number one. The Lord desires for you to go to the other side. The Lord desires for you to go. This is not an exhortation simply from the pastor, from the preacher. This is the Lord. You need to do this. When the Word of God is being preached, when you're reading your Bible, when you're listening to it on the radio, you need to say, Lord, how can I? Lord, I want to be like Cinderella. If the shoe fits, I want to wear it. Lord, how can I apply this to me? Lord, I want you to be speaking, not just, I don't want to just hear that guy up there talking. Lord, I want you to speak to me through what he's saying. And Lord, I, I, if you're saying, go to the other side, Lord, then I'll go. I want to go where you want me to go. There, there's an old song that we sing. Um, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. 
or mountain, or plain, or sea. I'll say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. That's what you want to do in the Christian life. Lord, where do you want me to go? I'll go. The Lord desires for you to go to the other side. Listen, if you look at Matthew chapter 8, we're not going to do it right now, but that's the parallel passage to this. You know what the Lord says? He gave command for them to depart unto the other side. Listen, if you compare Scripture with Scripture, I love this about the Gospels. I've heard people say, well, they contradict. No, they don't. They complement each other. In, in Mark chapter 5, for example, it talks about the maniac of Gadara, the maniac from the country of the Gadarenes. If you look at Matthew chapter 8, you know what you find out? There were two of them. You say, is the Bible contradicting? No. In Mark chapter 5, it focuses on one of them. And in Matthew chapter 8, it mentions both. You say, why? Because in any eyewitness account, that's how that typically works. When police investigate something and everyone's story collaborates so perfectly that there's no variance and there's no complementing factors or truths whatsoever, they know they colluded and they're all lying together. That's how you know these Gospels are truth, guys. Now, let me say it like this. In Matthew 8, you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't say, guys, if you feel like it, and if you'd like to, and if the weather's nice, and what do you guys think? Maybe we should go on the, other, the boat and get on the other side. You know what he says? Let's go. The Lord desires that for you. As a matter of fact, he's commanding you to. You know what will get in the way? Fear. Well, I don't know what's on the other side. What if God asks me to do this? What if the Lord tells me to do this? What, what if this pops up? What if, hey, you know what? You can live that way for the rest of your life and you'll never grow as a Christian. You know what else may get in the way? Laziness. Look at Proverbs chapter 24. Proverbs chapter number 24. You know what happens sometimes? You're saved, you get saved, and you sort of just get lazy. Come on, we've all been there. Spiritually, do I really need to read my Bible? Do I really need to pray? Do I really need to go to church today? Do I, does it really matter? And the answer, of course, is yes. Yes. When you find yourself slipping in that direction, understand the Lord is saying, I want you to go beyond where you're at, and there's a spiritual laziness that's taking over, and you've got to fight that. Proverbs chapter number 24, look at verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns, and nettles had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. See, how does that apply to me spiritually? If you want to live in spiritual poverty, don't do anything. Don't put any effort in the Christian life. Just trust Christ as your Savior and do nothing. You know what you're going to do? You're never going to make it to the other side. Listen, I'm not talking about the other side of heaven. If you're saved, you're going. You might go kicking and screaming, but you're going. Amen? The question is, do you want to go first class? The other side that we're looking at this morning is not so much a picture of heaven in eternity as much as it is things that God wants you to learn as a child of God. None of us have arrived yet, including this preacher. There are things that I learn on a daily basis. How many of you have been in a certain field or trade for any, longer than five years? Anybody here? All right, longer than 10 years. 20. All right, do, do you, after 5, 10, 15, 20 years, do you still find yourself saying, man, I'm still learning stuff every day? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've been in the industry that I work in in my secular job for almost nine years, and I can tell you this, almost on a weekly basis I go, well, never thought that would happen. <laughs> <laughs> you say, what is that? You're not done learning. The Lord desires for you to go to the other side. But laziness, and let me say this, complacency can get in the way. Complacency is a blight that saps energy, dulls attitudes, and causes a drain on the brain. The first symptom is satisfaction with things as they are. The second is rejection of things as they might be. Good enough becomes today's watchword and tomorrow's standard. Complacency makes people fear the unknown, mistrust the untried, and abhor the new. Like water, complacent people follow the easiest course downhill. And they draw false strength from looking back instead of looking forward. You know, over there in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, is an interesting thing. There's uh, the plagues that God sends to the nation of Egypt. 
And if you want to study on, on just a number of things, pride, uh, complacency, I mean, you, you go and look at the plagues in Egypt, uh, 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 and you'll learn so many things from that. And in Exodus chapter 8, there's frogs. Can you imagine waking up, you open the fridge, and frogs jump out? You open the toilet, and boy, a frog pops out. Open the microwave, a, pop, a frog pops out. You go to play in the backyard, and the kids are stepping all over frogs. And you're going in for dinner. What are we going to have for dinner? Frog. What are we going to have for breakfast? Frog. What are going to have for lunch? Frog sandwich. Just change it up a little bit. You know, frogs are everywhere. It's a plague. You understand? It's a plague. And Moses goes to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter, and he goes, Hey, are you done yet? And Pharaoh goes, Entreat thy God for me. Speak to your God. And Moses asks him an awesome question. He says this, When would you like for me to ask God to take these frogs away? Do you know what Pharaoh's answer is? Tomorrow. Not me, man. Right now. I mean, if he's powerful enough to make him show up like that, he's powerful enough to take him away like that, right? And yet, you know what happens? Pharaoh just sort of got used to the scenery. You know what happens to you as a Christian sometimes? You just get used to the scenery. Go to church, listen to the Bible, go home. Eh, I'm good. That burning desire to know God, to go beyond where you're at, to know Him better, to love sin less, to love the world less, to love Jesus Christ more, to get into Him and Him into you all the way, boy, that just sort of wanes over time. Why? Complacency. How about pride? Sometimes the Lord says, let's go to the other side, and you go, uh-uh, I don't need to go to the other side. That's for the other people at church. That's for the new Christians that don't know any Bible. I know some Bible. A young lady asked to speak with her pastor, asked to make an appointment to talk with him about a, a sin that she was worried about. When she saw him, she said, Pastor, I've become aware of a sin in my life, and I just feel like I need to talk to somebody about it. She said, Pastor, when I look in the mirror, I see the most beautiful person at church. And I go to church, I look at all the other ladies, and I just think, they're ugly compared to me. Every woman here is getting mad right now. <laughs> and let me just say, no, this is not based on a true story. She said, I can't find anyone more beautiful than me. No one compares with my beauty. What can I do about this sin? The pastor in his excellent wisdom said, Mary, this is not a sin. This is just a big mistake. You know what, though? Pride will, pride will make you see things in a way that they don't actually exist. I read a story about 30, 32 years ago. There was two ships in the Black Sea, Russian ships in the Black Sea over there in the oil country there. And they were coming at each other. And both those ships, it, they, they eventually crashed and people lost their lives. But the reason that it happened wasn't because of failure in technology. It wasn't that they didn't know they were approaching each other. It was that when the captain from this ship communicated with the captain from this ship, he said, you need to yield course. We're heading in your direction. And this guy said, no, you need to yield course. We're heading in your direction. And eventually they go, ah, let's play chicken. Too late. You say, what's the problem? Pride. Pride. You know what the Lord's telling you? Listen, you've learned some stuff. And you've been with me through some things. But you haven't learned everything yet. I want to take you to the other side. Well, Lord, I feel content here. I think I know enough, and I've learned enough. And, and Lord, really, you should be worried about those other people. Muhammad Ali, I don't remember. What, his real name was Cassius Clay, wasn't it? So, yeah. Muhammad Ali, uh, he uh, wasn't exactly the most humble man in the world. I am the greatest, you know. And they put that to music. And Boy, if you're working out. Yeah, you know, you know, you could you could be a uh, hundred pounds lifting ten pounds and feel like you could overcome the world. <laughs> Listening to you know Muhammad Ali rap, I am the greatest. You know, Muhammad Ali's in an airplane one time, and the airplane's experiencing turbulence. They're bouncing around, and that that stewardess comes up, flight attendant comes up, and she says, "Sir, I'm gonna have to ask you to buckle up." He says, "Superman don't need no seatbelt," and without skipping the beat. She says, Superman don't need no airplane to fly either, brother. <laughs> now listen, 
Sometimes, sometimes we get to thinking we're Superman and we forget who we are. You say, what is that? Pride. We get to thinking, I've come far enough. I know enough. It's like, it's like that picture in the Old Testament of the bridegroom coming to speak to the bride. And he speaks through the door and says, hey, I want to have fellowship with you. And you know what she says? I've put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I've washed my feet. How shall I defile them? You say, what is that? It's pride. It's saying, listen, it, it's not a matter of, hey, good morning. How you doing? Hey, that's never happened before. See, I told you you can learn new things every day. Amen. Hey, tip that man very well. Amen. Yeah, when you see someone coming out of the corner of your eye, usually it's not that. I'm like, hey, that's cool, though. I don't mind that. That could interrupt every service. I would not mind that at all. <laughs> the point is this, when it comes to pride, you can't ever get to the place where you go, I've come far enough. I've learned enough. I've grown enough. All right? There's a, there's a matter of you learning as a child of God. There's somewhere else the Lord wants me to go. Now, I told you earlier, there's a parallel passage to this. Look at Matthew chapter number 8. Go there if you would. Matthew chapter number 8. When I say a parallel passage, what I mean, especially if you've never heard that phrase before, is simply this. The same story in another part of the Bible. It's told, it's told somewhere else. And you're going to find details in that other part of the Bible. You'll find that sometimes from Kings to Chronicles, from Samuel to Kings. All right? And uh, here in Matthew chapter 8, I want to point something out to you that you don't find in Mark chapter number 4. Look at Matthew chapter number 8, and look, if you would, at verse number 19. Matthew chapter 8 and verse number 19. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Now let me just stop you real quick before we read the rest of it. Do you know what just happened in the verse prior? Look at the verse prior. In the verse prior, Jesus gave commandment to those that were following him to go to the other side. So now this young man hears that commandment, and he goes, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And the Lord says, great, we're about to load up on the boat, let's go. Read the rest of it. Jesus saith unto him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and Bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead. Now let me say this. If someone came to me and said, Pastor, I'd like to join New Heights Baptist Church, but I've got to go to a funeral for my dad first, I would say, God bless you. We'll see you when you get back. The Lord didn't say that. He said, you want to get on the boat? You want to catch this ride? You come now. Let me say this, secondly, the Lord requires letting go of some baggage if you want to get there. Too many Christians want to bring their baggage with them on the trip, and God's like, uh-uh, you're not bringing that. That didn't help you before you were saved. It hasn't helped you since you've been saved. We're going to leave that behind. Now, you might think that's rough language for someone talking about their family, but the Lord saw something in that. The Lord saw as much as you love your family. That's a good thing. If you love your family more than me, you can't follow me. What, you say, how can you say that, preacher? What happens when the family ridicules you for following Jesus Christ? How are you going to deal with that? If you have not decided, Lord, I'm letting go of anything that will hold me back from following you more closely, how do you, rec how do you reconcile those things? You won't make it on the trip if you don't learn that baggage is going to slow you down. I remember when we were going to Bolivia, I asked my wife last night, I said, how many, how many bags did we take with us? Now, I, don't, I think the number that we took, now, we, didn't, we did not use a container. We were missionaries to go into Bolivia. Some missionaries ship a bunch of stuff. They, they'll ship a car. They'll ship, you know, half their house. And they'll do it in these big containers. We didn't have that. So, you know, we don't want to spend the money on it. We figured, okay, we were broke when we started this thing. We don't have a lot of stuff right now. Let's just fit whatever we got in the suitcases. But I'll tell you what's amazing. Even as broke missionaries, we had 16 suitcases worth of stuff. And let me tell you something, at that time, she was two, and she was baby. And she was non-existent yet. Amen. And say, so who's carrying all the bags? You know? And my wife's doing what she can, but she's got two kids. These are 16 bags. You say, how did that work? I don't even know how we did it. I can tell you this, we weren't running through the airport. You know what those bags do? They slow you down. Somewhere, if you want to get somewhere quick, you've got to learn to let go of the baggage. Lord, I'd like to go to the other side. Lord, I want to grow. I want to get beyond where I'm at. Okay, look behind you and look at the baggage that's there. 
and ask yourself, has that thing helped you draw closer to Jesus Christ, or has it kept you on the shore the entire time? I've learned this. Everybody wants to lose weight and feel better, but nobody wants to put down the donut. <laughs> no one wants to let go of the marshmallow snowman. <laughs> Gloria Pitzer said about the only thing that comes to us without effort is old age. It's true. They did a study back in the 80s, and they did a survey between moms in Japan and moms in the United States, and they they asked the moms in the United States, what's the number one thing that your child needs to succeed in their education? You know what the moms in the state said overwhelmingly? Ability. The moms in Japan, you know what they said? Effort. You do better with effort. You know what I'm telling you? It's going to take some effort. For those of you that look at where you're wanting to go with the Lord, and you go, okay, Lord, I want to go with you, it's going to take some effort to let go of some of that baggage. But boy, it'll be worth it when you get to the other side. I won't forget when we were moving from Tennessee to Colorado. And we had a 26-foot U-Haul. Was it 26-foot, I think? And uh, I don't know. Why am I looking? I, I, that's not the detail I should ask her. If I were to ask her, what day was this? Or if I were to ask her, what was she wearing? Or what color tie did I have on? She'd remember that. All right? 26, I think it was a 26-foot U-Haul. And then we had a dolly, and I was pulling her, her uh, Ford Explorer on that dolly. And then she was driving my Ford Focus, I think it was, or no? 500, the Ford 500, that's what it was. And she's got that thing jammed full, and dogs are in that one, and we got a cat in the, in the, in the U-Haul. And boy, I'll tell you what. There were trips when I was on deputation, when I drove by myself in a minivan, where I got from Louisville, Kentucky, to uh, Colorado Springs in 17 hours. Don't ask me. I'm not proud of that, Lord. I should confess that right now. I'll never forget when my wife was uh, uh, pregnant with Isabella, and she was, we were wanting to find out what the, the gender of, of the baby was. I was in Louisville, Lexington, Lexington, not Louisville, Lexington, Kentucky, at a, at a missions conference. And I told my wife, well, honey, I'm sorry to miss the appointment. I love you. I went to lie down in the bed there in that prophet's chamber, and I said, okay, her appointment's at 2 o'clock. It's 9 o'clock right now, but that's 7 o'clock there. If I drive and I don't stop, and I got up and I drove all night long. And I got there just in time. I literally walked in the door with flowers. Oh, this is. I am the man who will fight for your honor. I got the flowers in my hand. I bust into the room. And right then, the doctor looks over, a female doctor. And she goes, it's a, are you the dad? She starts crying. She starts crying, you know. And, uh, boy, great. But I tell you what. I would not have made that trip with the 26-foot U-Haul pulling the, the, the Ford Explorer and the dogs cramming the other car. That trip we took was a lot longer. You say, why? Lots of baggage. Lots to carry with us. If you want to get somewhere quickly, it may take some effort, but you've got to let go of the baggage. Look at Mark chapter 2. I, I know I've recently referred to this passage, but I, I'd like to look at it again one more time. I have this joke at home with my wife. Sometimes I'll tell her, I'll, I'll ask her a question, and it's sort of like on Saturdays, I'll ask her a question about something. She goes, are you preaching on this? Are you preaching on that passage? I'm like, well, that's, yeah, we're preaching on that passage. You've preached on that before. <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> Mark chapter 2, look if you would at, and my wife is, I love her, I love her to death, and I tell her all the time, it's not the same when you're not here at church, and now she's going, yeah, I can see why, you have no one to pick on. <laughs> see, I can pick on her, no, she can't go anywhere, amen. Mark chapter 2, I hope, Mark chapter 2, look if you would at uh, verse number 1, and again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he, Jesus, was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh to him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. 
And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. You know, they never, they never get to, did get to the top of that roof and go, man, sure does think this roof's in the way. They never got there and said, boy, Jesus is so close, but if just this roof, you know, if it wasn't for this roof, we could see him. You know what some Christians do? If it wasn't for my past, you can break that up. You understand that, right? You don't have to carry that with you in the future. You don't have to sit there on top of the roof and go, man, Lord, I'm so close to you. And the Lord knows. You know what? You know what's on the other side of that roof? Healing. You know what they had to do? Break that roof up. You might have to leave some of that baggage behind. Matthew chapter number 8. Let's go back there. And thirdly, let me say this. Getting to the other side means the Lord chooses the method of transportation. Matthew chapter number 8, look if you would at verse number 23. Matthew chapter 8, look if you would at verse number 23. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now you might think, well, duh, it's a, it's a sea. How else are they going to get there? Can I remind you of something? In Matthew 14... They take another one of these trips across the lake there. And in the middle of that storm, you know who's walking on the water? You know who joins him? Peter. They could have done that if the Lord wanted to. He didn't choose to do that. Can I say this right now? I love my wife, and she wants to go on a cruise someday. And I'll tell you right now, I'm putting it off as long as I can. And no, not because of the finances alone. No, that's not it. It's because I feel like a cruise is a death trap. <laughs> you're on a metal box in the middle of nowhere on the water. You Navy guys, whoever you are, if you're here, God bless you. I appreciate Navy guys. I couldn't do it. I'd go insane. Listen, when I read these stories about the Lord saying, come on, disciples, let's go on the ship. I'm like, uh-uh, I'll stay on the shore. You know, I'll watch it later on YouTube, amen. <laughs> you tell me how it went and I'll listen to the message later. I don't want to go on that ship. Why? Because it's safer on the land. The Lord chooses the method of transportation. You know what some of you go, you know, I know some of you have gone through. You go, Lord, that's where I want to go. I just don't want to go this way. Lord, do I have to go through that to get there? Yeah. You know, think about this. The Lord in John chapter 20, you don't have to turn there, but in John 20, in verse 17, he tells this lady that at the, at the garden, or where, he, where he's, where he's uh, excuse me, the, the, the graveside, where he's come out of the tomb, he says, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended. Ten verses later, he's talking to another guy and says, thrust in your, your hands into my side and feel the nail prints in my hand. Ten verses later, that's someone that can travel at the speed of light and beyond. Couldn't he have chosen another method of transportation across the lake? Sure. He put them on that death trap to teach them something, though. You say, why? Because you're going to find out in a little bit they encounter a storm. And while there could have been another way to get across, the Lord wants them to experience it. There may be another way for you to learn some of the things you need to learn, but the Lord knows for you to get the lesson that you need, you might have to get on that ship. And let me say this. Fourthly, sometimes when you're going to the other side, you encounter storms. It's not smooth sailing all the time. Look at Mark chapter number 4. Mark chapter number 4. I think when I get to the place, and I hope it's many years from now, but when I get to the place where I'm too weak and too frail to preach anymore, I will still be able to enjoy, even if I was blind, sitting in a pew and hearing people turn the pages of their Bible. It's a beautiful sound. Mark chapter 4, look at verse number 36. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. Guys, let's ask ourselves this simple question. Does the Lord know they're about to encounter a storm? He's the one that can look at someone, and when they're saying something in their heart, he goes, why are you thinking that? He's the one that when Judas comes to betray him, he says, friend, where did you come? And just the chapter before, he talks about a man that comes to a wedding without the right garments, and he calls him friend, and he's cast out. He uses that term for a reason. He knows what's going to happen before it happens. 
He tells him to get into the ship. He's telling you, let's go. And you might even look above and go, Lord, are you sure? The clouds don't look quite right. And Lord, the, the breeze is picking up. This morning, I don't know about you guys, I was surprised by the snow. I mean, I saw in the forecast, it's going to be like 49 degrees or something like that, and windy. And so this morning, I get up, you know, it's dark, and I'm, I'm, I'm reviewing my notes for today and looking at some stuff, and I look outside, and it's like wind just blowing in fog. This fog and this wind. And I'm, you know, about 15 minutes later, I look out, and I see a snowflake. I go, is that snow? That's weird. Then a couple minutes later, I see about two or three. All of a sudden, by the time the light's out there, boy, whew, it's just a big storm. And I go, wait, where did that come from? Those disciples may have been able to look up there and see, Lord, I understand you know all things. You ever talk to God like that? Master, I know that thou knowest the way of life, and there is no one greater than you. And, and, and Just like Nicodemus did when he came to the Lord in John chapter 3. And Lord, you're the greatest, and you're so wonderful. The Lord just says, you must be born again. And we go, Lord, I know you know all things. He goes, then just follow me. Oh, well, about that, Lord. I know you know all things, but maybe those disciples could have looked at that sky and said, Lord, are you sure? Why? Because there was a storm brewing. You know, it's tough about storms like that. It's harder when there's little ships following you. Look at, if you would, at verse number 36. Look at the end of that verse. There were also with him other little ships. The Bible doesn't say why they were there. I don't know if they were supply ships. I'm not sure what they were there for, but there's little ships there. Do you know as a father you've got little ships following you? As a mother you've got little ships following you? As a Christian you've got little ships following you? You've got people following your example whether you know it or not. And sometimes when you're going through a storm, can I just remind you those ships are there as well. And how you react to that storm can affect them in a great way. My life shall touch a dozen lives before this day is done. Leave countless marks for good or ill ere sets the evening sun. This is the wish I always wish, the prayer I always pray. Lord, may my life help others. It touches by the way. Dr. John Getty went to what is now Vanuatu in the South Sea Islands in 1848 and worked there for God for 24 years. On the tablet erected to his memory, and I believe that tablet is still there, these words are inscribed. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Boy, wouldn't that be great to say about Aurora. We've got some work to do, guys. Job security, amen. But here's the point. Those storms that you encounter, they affect other people as well. Sometimes you get hit from all sides. Look, if you would, at verse 37. A great storm of wind arose, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. You ever feel like you just can't take any more? Lord, I'm trying to follow you. I'm trying to do the right thing. Lord, I'm trying to go to the other side. Lord, I, and Lord, it just seems like you're not really concerned with this. Lord, it seems like you're sleeping. Can I tell you, he does that sometimes to be an example to you. Recently, I was helping one of my kids with something. I'm not going to tell you the exact story because I care about their privacy. I, I, you know, we have fun with the sermon illustrations, but some things are things that nobody else needs to know. And I'll just say this. I'll just say that one of my kids was struggling with a certain thing, and I, I pushed them to do it, and it was very hard, and there were tears that were shed, but eventually they did, and they said thanks. You say, why? Because they had to realize that what felt like the end of the world to them wasn't. Do you understand God does that with you sometimes? You're going, Lord, I can't take anymore. The ship is full. I don't know if I can take one more drop of water. And oh, by the way, it seems, Lord, like you're sleeping on the job. And the Lord says, you know, I'm just waiting for you to come talk to me about this. I'll fix it as soon as you talk to me. These are things you don't learn when you stay on the shore, by the way. And fifthly, let me say this. Going through the storm allows you to experience a great calm on the other side of that storm. Mark 4, look if you would at verse 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind. I don't know about you, but there's, there's nothing like knowing that daddy's there. 
I mean, my dad, I've shared this with the church before, my dad is my hero. And when I was a kid, I thought my dad could do anything. I remember as a kid, my dad was a, not even saved yet, so don't judge him for this, but I remember watching Rambo when I was like, I don't know, five. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I looked at Rambo, I'm like, I bet that's what my dad looks like with his shirt off. Right. <laughs> I just thought he could do anything. He could take anybody. That was dad, you know. And I want to be that for my kids. You know, I hope they're probably like, Dad, no, you don't look anything like that guy with your shirt off. <laughs> but here's the point. There's nothing like when Dad steps up and says, I've got this. I've got this. Jesus comes above from the hinder part of the ship where he was sleeping on a pillow. I love that. You don't love the Bible describing things for you? Not only does it say he's asleep, it says he's in the hinder part of the ship, it's in the back, and he's sleeping on a pillow. Like a waterbed. Remember the 80s waterbeds? Anybody remember that? All right? You know, you get the worst idea in the world for your back. It's one of those things that looked like a great idea at the time. Everybody did it, but man, bad idea for your back. But you know, you get on a boat and that thing's rocking, and boy, if you just, if, if you know that you've got the one with you that can calm the storm, it really doesn't matter. So Jesus is asleep. And they wake him up and they shake him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he's going, boys, calm down. I got this. He gets up and starts walking up the stairs. I wonder if it's almost like a dad that you wake up in the middle of the night because you have a bad dream. <laughs> they come in and you're I have a bad dream. And I'm going, it's a dream. Go to bed. You know, sometimes you're not very compassionate. You know, you want all this compassion from God. And when your kids come, you're like, go to sleep, kid, you know. And uh, sometimes I, I wonder if that's how it was for the Lord when they woke him up. He just says, really? How often do I sleep? I'm healing. I'm raising the dead. I'm feeding people. I'm doing this. I'm, doing, I'm answering all your stupid questions. And I'm taking a break for a little bit. Can I get a nap? Well, Lord, you don't understand. If you really cared about us, I do. Just be quiet and watch. He gets up there and rebukes that wind and says unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Look down if you would at verse number 41. If you don't go through that storm, you never come to that same conclusion. What manner of man is this? That even the wind and the seas obey him. You want to know the Lord? Let him take you to the other side. I want that. There's a storm that might be brewing coming your way. Well, I don't want that. Well, you'll never experience this. You know what Jesus says? In John chapter 14, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He says that before he goes to die. Do you know what he says before he goes back up to heaven? Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. You know why? Because we lack it in our lives. But you can experience it. We're so eager to have peace sometimes, we'll simply jump ship to get out of the problem or what we think the problem is. The problem is not the ship. You go, I, ever since I started coming to church, things are hard. I'm just going to, okay, jump out, see how things go for you after that. Well, ever since I became serious for God, and I started trying to read my Bible, and I started giving, I started doing this, I've got these problems. All right, well, just see what happens when you abandon that. That's not the problem. The problem is that you don't, you're not at a place yet where you are willing to wake up the master and say, Lord, I need you. Once you get to that place, he'll take care of the issue. And he'll bring peace. But you'll never experience it if you never get in the boat. Look at Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Let me say this. In going to the other side, you learn that the other side is not all about you. Amen. You know how some people live their lives? This is me, and here's the world. <laughs> look, Mark chapter 5, look if you would at verse number 1. They came over unto the other side of the sea. After that whole storm and the ship thing happens, after the Lord rebukes the wind, okay, God, I get it. I've got the lesson. Lesson is, trust you. You're all powerful. Great. Getting to the other side. We're on the other side now. Everything's going to be good, right? As soon as they get off the boat, look what encounters them. An unclean spirit. Now, do you know how that story ends? Look, if you would, at verse number 
15. When the town comes to see Jesus, they see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. But boy, you know that? That man that had the unclean spirit cast out of him, you know what he says? When the Lord's about to get back into that ship and go back to the other side again, you know what that man says? Lord, can I follow you? Do you know what those disciples learned the other side was about? It wasn't just about lessons for them. It was about others. Christmas Eve 1910, General William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, struggling in his health, very feeble and very frail. And it was impossible for him to attend the annual convention of the Salvation Army. By the way, the Salvation Army used to be people that actually preached the gospel. That's why they called it Salvation Army. And they were soldiers sent out to street preach and to go preach the gospel wherever people were at so they could lead them to Christ. That's what it initially was. And William Booth had gotten uh, to become aged, and he couldn't uh, join the convention. He couldn't experience that time with them. And funds were limited, and telegrams used to charge by the word. Do you remember long-distance phone calls? Anybody remember that? (laughs) MCI, Sprint, AT&T, remember all that? I remember my dad. And, And listen, you know, there's words in Spanish I cannot repeat this morning. When he would get the AT&T or MCI phone bill, and he'd go, <gasps> and he'd say some things, and he'd go to my sisters right away and go, you made these calls. Look at how much this cost us. You know, Remember when calling used to cost a lot of money? Yeah. Do you remember when cell phones first came out? Yeah. And boy, you, you know, you, you'd answer that phone only when you knew you had to. Right. Boy, you'd pull out that brick and flip it and go, Hello? But, you know, it costs a lot of money. It's gotten cheaper over time. Hey, when they started sending telegrams, they charged by the word. And even though he could not join that annual convention, they said, look, we think it would really rally the troops and it would really be an encouraging thing for them to, to hear about your life and ministry and what wisdom would you pass on? What would you say to all those gathered there? One word. That telegram comes through on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And it simply says, others. Others. Can I say this, Christian? You sometimes are going through some things, and God is trying to bring you beyond where you're at, not just because of you, but for the sake of others. Mark chapter 5. Verse 18, we just read it. Verse number 19, this man desires to follow Jesus Christ. How be it, verse 19, Jesus suffered him not, but say to him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in the capitalist how great things Jesus had done for him and all men did Marvel. The other side, if you stick it out, allows you to see others follow Jesus along with you. Don't you want to go there? I do. Let me say this in closing. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. Do you ever... Ever read your Bible and wonder, why did he go, okay, guys, let's go to the other side? They go through a storm. They cast the devil out of the maniac of Gadara. Okay, guys, time to go to the other side. Well, Lord, that's where we started. We started back over there. What, what are we going to go back? Let me say this. The other side is not just about one single destination. It's about a lifelong lesson. The Lord's always trying to teach you, and you're not done. If you're saved, there's some things God wants to do in your life. There's some people He wants you to reach. There's some places He wants to take you. Let me say this. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, a lot of what I just said maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But let me say this. Very simple, plain terms. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're missing out on the other, other side. You're missing out on a place called heaven. And that book says the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want you to go to hell. 
You might say, why would God send me? I'm a decent person. Why would God send me to hell? You're in, God is not sending you to hell. If you go, it's because you reject the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Last I checked, everyone in here is a sinner, myself included. I cannot offer up a sacrifice that is perfect to God for my sin because of my sinful nature. I can't do it. But a sinless man can, and he did 2,000 years ago. Amen. And if you're willing to accept his righteousness on your, on your part, you don't have to go to hell. You can make it to the other, other side. Christian, how about you? Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed.